Thank you. <coughs> so, committee, we are um, going to look at H207, the um, Montpelier Charter change. And for some odd reason, I seem to have lost my folder. But I can mainly remember what we talked about. So, um, where are we here in terms of what we're thinking right now? And um, maybe, Tucker, would you join us for a moment here? And, sure. and this might also uh, want to involve um, Chris, um, I mean Will, possibly this question. So <coughs> we, um, one of the think one of the questions that came up by some of our colleagues was <coughs> well two questions one was whenever a local vote is made it impacts the rest of the state because of budgetary uh, for example if you're doing creating a tiff it's going to affect the rest of the state so some response to that and primarily for you i guess is the issue of if we let non-citizens vote why would we also not let non-residents vote and we in our area we have a couple towns who have like 60 percent of the population is non-resident they're second homeowners who spend a lot of time in Vermont and are affected by the tax rate and by the decisions of the voters of the town, but they're not allowed to vote. So, so do you, so do you, would you like to, is, what, is, what would be the issues around non-resident voting? And then we'll ask Will also that. Are there, from your perspective? Sure. Good afternoon, Tucker Anderson, Office of Legislative Council. Both of those sound like policy issues that would need to be debated and considered by you as legislators. I don't necessarily see any legal advice being particularly helpful for that discussion. Okay. The last time we were here, I helped frame the first issue that you brought up about local elections impacting the finances and duties of the state potentially oh, yeah. with respect to TIF districts. Um, That's right, yeah. So to briefly outline that again, um, that is going to be the case for every municipality, whether or not that municipality allows non-citizens to vote. Uh, local elections at some point may have an impact on statewide policies and issues. That's just a matter of fact. It is a policy consideration for all of you as to whether you want to allow this particular municipality to have non-citizens voting in some of those local ballot issues that have echoing ramifications that are greater than the municipality. Um, there's no particular legal constitutional issue there for me to discuss. Okay, thank you. No. I, I, I'm, I'm not <coughs> as concerned about the non-residents because the non-residents, this is trying to focus on residents who live here full-time who would like to have a voice in their in the community they live in. Um, so I'm not as concerned about the non-residents. But um, and Tacoma Park, which is the, our one municipality we can look at with experience. But actually, I, I, do, I, I want to interrupt just for a second, because yeah. I, I, I just read this testimony from Roberta Garland, a local citizen, who says that in the Tacoma Park, she said that um, San Francisco and Chicago allow non-citizens to vote in school council elections. 11 municipalities in Maryland allow non-citizens to vote in local affairs. Tacoma Park has allowed this since 1992. Right. Chevy Chase started allowing this in 2018. I'm just saying, I, was, I didn't realize that 11 towns in Maryland mm -hmm. are doing it. Oh, so it's I not just Tacoma. Up, but I thought <laughs> right. I had no, no, that's good. So then, because my question is, how have they dealt with uh, any local issue that might have state finance impact. To me, that's a red herring. Mm -hmm. I sort of view it as a red herring, but I'm just curious, have there been any issues that have arisen in those 11 towns in Maryland that have adopted this in terms of 
placing undue burden on the state finances? I have not researched that issue. I didn't hear any testimony about that particular issue. Um, when Tacoma Park uh, testified, um, that is a question that's best answered by them. Okay. Uh, so, so if you remember last time we talked about this, I said that uh, Montpelier had a population of 16,700 and there were so many registered voters and stuff. And on the top of my um, notes for that, it said Taco. And I couldn't figure, that was, it was Tacoma Park. I finally figured out that those numbers related to Tacoma Park, even right. though I only had written down Paco. Right. And I thought you were thinking about Paco, who had been involved with that district. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so we now have, it looks like, 13 municipalities, uh, if you include Chicago and San Francisco. <clears throat> and Chevy Chase also. That, so, that was the only question I had. So about 14, that. as far as we can identify, is that and Roberta is right here, so we can ask her when she testifies. Any other questions? Well, or? Yeah, Tucker, I just, I mean, we've gone over this before, but I just would like you to do it again if you can. Going back to the constitutional historic that maybe it was Betsy who shared it with us about how towns are creatures of the state. If, they have the ability to do certain things. You know what I'm getting at? Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure, and yes, that was Betsy Ann Rask who made the very thorough and articulate presentation. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <what you're doing. laughs> sure. the, the briefest possible summary is that unless the Constitution prohibits you, the legislature, from granting this power to the municipalities, then you may give it to them. Okay. And there is no particular restriction on qualifications for local elections. Therefore, you have the ability to delegate this to the city of Montpelier through this special law. That is the briefest, squarest summary that I can give you without going through the 20, no, 18 page document. No, that was good, I just needed to be reminded. Any more questions for Tucker? Okay. Thank you. Will, would you like to just join us and talk a little bit about the issue of non-citizen versus non-resident? And I know, it, like Tucker said, it's a policy decision, but it is a question that we have been asked. Sure. <coughs> Will Senning, Director of Elections for the Record. And Madam Chair, I wasn't prepared for any direct testimony. We, you know, this is pretty informal discussion, sure. so. Do you have a specific question in that regard? Well, how, just when you establish residency, how do you establish residency as opposed to being a, not being a resident? In Vermont? Yeah. For purposes of the election law. Yeah. Both those things are important because there's multiple residency definitions, right. as you know. But this is for elections. Yeah. For voter registration purposes, it's, I often say, it's a fairly subjective analysis, and which hinges primarily on whether you consider the place to be your principal dwelling place. And you have an intent to return there if temporarily absent, coupled with an act or acts consistent with that intent. That's basically the definition. It starts with the basic premise that you consider it your principal dwelling place. But that's not the tax definition. No, it's not. Nor the um, school tuition assessment. So that's the principal that for you. Consider it your dwelling place. Primary dwelling place. And how do you define primary dwelling place? Good question. Honestly. Uh, the place you spend the primary amount of your time, most significant amount of your time. Is that 51%? No, not necessarily. So if you just, if you said, I'm, <clears throat> this is my primary dwelling, we had a, this was a huge issue in Grafton and yeah. Wyndham, as you remember. Overwind. Overwind. Yeah. And people who, 
wanted to vote but were n had their primary residence in someplace else, how, how would they have established their primary residence so that they would have been allowed to vote? Would they have to change where they paid their income? To, I mean, how do you, if it's different for tax purposes and different for um, Medicaid or whatever, how do you how do you establish that and how do you enforce that? In the courts, there's not a whole lot of case law on it. I've looked into it. Some kind of act, as, as I was saying, the statute ends with an act or acts consistent with that intent. The kind of stuff courts would look for, maintenance of a bank account, um, P.O. box, some, some set of indicia that show you still have some connection to the community. However, I'd say that that's usually looked at in the context of somebody who has left and maintains that they're coming back. So was there as the principal dwelling place, then left for some unanticipated reason. Mom is sick, and you need to go stay with her mm -hmm. for six months. You get challenged by the Board of Civil Authority in your town. You say, no, nope, I intend to return there as soon as my mom passes away, which might be an indefinite period of time. Um, then the court would say, well, what can you show me that, that tells me your plans to come back? You still have the house, you haven't sold it. You know, if you've sold a house that you once had before, that shows pretty well that you don't intend to come back. Um, but the second home ownership is a difficult one. Um, although in most cases, I think it's pretty clear whether or not it's the person's primary dwelling place. And then sort of the, The baseline that everyone operates from also is, is the one thing you don't want to do is be registered in two places. So at least if you're going to be claiming Vermont's your principal dwelling place, you're not also registered in Connecticut or Florida. Mm -hmm. so, it's highly subjective is where I start. But it, it is illegal to be uh, registered in two places to vote, correct? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Just discussing that with my election director colleagues across the country yesterday morning. But you're not able, or you're not supposed to vote in two places. Two different things is what you just said. So right. clearly, you're not supposed to vote in two places. Right. So, so it's illegal to vote in two places. Yes. To be registered. And you are encouraged to be registered in only one. Yeah, there's sort of tangential <laughs> statutes that get to it. For instance, where statutes don't say if you move and register somewhere else. Either that clerk or you are meant to call and remove yourself from the rolls, but there's typically there are not definitive statements to say it's against the law to be registered in two places. And I think that's probably historically over time because it's so easy to make that error unknowingly. Well, end up registered in two places. It takes a while. Yeah. So if the, somebody, oh, go ahead. The last point I would make in reference to this bill is. That I don't necessarily see the relationship of this discussion with the bill before you. Right. Which is to say that citizenship, unlike residency, is not subjective at all and is very easy to prove or disprove. Um, and so I don't think that this bill raises the same kind of questions that one right. would raise if it proposed to have non residents. Right. It, it just it raises the question with our colleagues. That's that's where the question comes from. So if you were, since you're not supposed to vote in two places, if you were had dual citizenship, no, you can't have dual citizenship in the United States, can you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sure With you someplace else. So could you vote in that someplace else and vote in Montpelier? The other country? <coughs> I suppose you could. Depends on their laws. They're on, depends, depends on, on their laws. laws. Yeah, you can't vote in England if you vote here. OK. I have enough to know our laws. Exactly. Don't you don't know the election laws <laughs> of the world? I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Okay. But you can go. There'll be a test next week. Okay. <laughs> but as we heard from Roberta, when she lived in Norway, she uh, could vote in those local elections, not in the federal elections, but she could vote in the local elections and she could vote here. And send the presidential ballot back here. Okay. Any ballot. And can't you vote? I mean, 
when, when we had a child at school abroad, they voted in every election. Absentee ballots are good for every election. From our perspective, I don't know about Norway. Yeah, but yes. no, but from our. Yeah. Okay. okay. I did have one more question, but my senior moment just. It'll pop. It will pop up at some point. Um, can I ask you a question? Not exactly on the point, <laughs> but okay. in your, um, it's, my impression is that amongst people who direct elections in the United States, there's sort of a mutual aid uh, attitude. Like you work with your colleagues around the country to sort things out. Yes. Are you, are you working in any way to sort out what's going on in Iowa? <laughs> <laughs> he's just grateful he's not the head of elections in Iowa right now. No, and yet that, you guys give me the opportunity, just since there's an audience yeah. here, to make the important distinction. Paper ballots. Paper ballots. Well, that, but more importantly, to your question, is that the, that election primary caucus last night was not administered by the state. Right. In, oh, in right. Way, or by the caucus, right. Democratic by the party function. Uh -huh. And so my election director colleague in Iowa had nothing to do with uh -huh. that process last night. There have been suggestions that we should do away with the state-run primary in Vermont and have it administered by the parties, and we could save a bundle. Yeah, and look, well, I guess we are. going to lead to a lot of discussion about it. We are not going down that road I, I don't anytime think soon. We necessarily, but there have been discussions, as you well know. But it's interesting. Well, I think it, some of the reason that some of these states like Iowa still have their caucuses is because the legislature won't fund the primary. The fact what? that you guys pay Four hundred thousand yeah. dollars to pay for all our primary ballots is a big investment. But this is like our public records discussion. What is the business? These are core functions no, of but, a democracy. No, but the but in determining a party's candidate. A party's it, candidate in determining candidates. Period. <laughs> we happen to have a party system. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get into this, really but the, the primaries are to determine <laughs> the party's candidate. They are to determine who our candidates. Are. Our party candidates are. I think it's a function of state government, and I'm well, glad we fund it. It hasn't been for very long. the benefits of funding it and having it done professionally by people who know how to do it. And it hasn't that. been the state party. It hasn't been a state function for very long in Vermont. I'm thrilled it's currently a state function. And we're more thrilled after last night's mess in Iowa. Um, when did it start to be a state function? I think in 73. 76, Because the 72 wow. election, we still did caucuses. Amazing. I thought it always was. No. <laughs> April no. McCollum for the Free Press is working on a story about the history mm -hmm. of it. Oh, I remember going to the caucuses in 70, for the 72 election, because we had just moved here. And I heard today that in 76, the first time we had the primary, the caucuses also were going on yeah. at the same time. Yeah. All right. So you Thank caucused you. for Nixon? <laughs> I did. I did. I caucused. Yes. Thank checking. you. Since 1976. Uh -huh. Wow. So, does anybody else have anything they'd like to weigh in on here with some new material or some new thoughts or hasn't had a chance so far? Thank you, Roberta, for your okay. second year testimony. Let's see first if there's anybody else who hasn't weighed in so far. That... No? Okay. Well, thank you, Madam um, Chair and members of the committee. Um, so my, my wife, um, Micah Garland, would have liked to have been here, but she's um, in Norway with her 90-year-old mother at this point. Um, so she has been living in Montpelier for 26 and a half years, and um, we bought a house here, we raised a child, we were really kind of involved in the community. Um, so what I did was I came up I um, came up with some questions that I yeah. thought might Go be um, questions that get addressed to addressed and questions that I and others who circulated petitions in Montpelier faced. Um, would it make sense for me to read through these or not? What does everybody think? Um, if you can just summarize, I, I don't. I mean. We kind of already read number seven about the. Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe I can read. Well, the first one 
Um, this is a question that we got a lot. Voting is a privilege that should be reserved for citizens. You know, people felt very, oh, there were quite a few people in the street who felt strongly about that, and we, and we had discussions with these folks. And did, so, did they all vote? Did they all vote in the? I mean, it, they talk about it as a privilege, but so it, yes, our, right. our numbers of know, right. people actually voting are right. so low. Right. Oh, I didn't ask them that. Right. Yeah, voting. <laughs> yeah. It's a privilege. Good, that good point. Exercise. So I will. I will say that in about five minutes we're going to do something else. So. Okay. Okay. Sorry. All right. So. Um, so I'll just read that. Some people believe that citizenship and voting are tied together, and for federal elections they are. However, federal law does not prohibit non-citizens from voting in state or, or local elections if states and or municipalities allow voting. Also, the Vermont Constitution and Vermont case law does not prohibit non-citizens from voting in local elections. This bill solely addresses voting in Montpelier affairs. The right to vote in federal and state elections will still be limited to U.S. citizens. So I just to point out here that in Burlington, they just withdrew theirs. Yes. And the two people that voted against it, one of them was a new American citizen. Hmm. Right. And some, people, some new Americans felt like, well, we worked very hard, and this is, mm -hmm. this is the right that we gained. Um, the majority of people who I spoke to in Montpelier who are um, from other countries, citizens of other countries, they were really for this bill. Mm -hmm. They didn't say that. Mm -hmm. I just found that interesting. Yeah, yeah. So another question is, um, let me say, uh, would this would this put non-citizens at risk of committing a crime? Number nine, and um, there's nothing in federal law which prohibits non-citizens from voting in local elections. As part of the naturalization process, applicants are asked if they have voted in federal, state, or local elections, and are asked to provide supplementary materials if they have done so. In this case, the supplementary material would be information from the city of Montpelier. And the city clerk of Tacoma Park, she, she addressed this too. She said she gives them information that they can attach to their um, application. Mm -hmm. um, another question that um, uh, we came up with, why can't people wait until they become citizens? That's number two. Yes. Um, the answer to this is as complicated as the number of people who would be impacted by the passing of this bill. And I gave some examples. Some people come from countries where dual citizenship is not allowed. They may have family and or strong connection to their original country of citizenship, but they don't want to give up their original citizenship. Some people would like to become a US citizen are in the lengthy process of establishing enough time to do so. One has to be a permanent resident for five years, or if married to a US citizen, three years. Um, oh, I didn't. The, oops, I don't know if you have the newest version. I wrote that um, it can take up to it can take up to ten years or more to even become a permanent resident. So it can take a really long time to even get to that step where you can consider citizenship. And it costs seven hundred and twenty-five dollars. And the Trump administration has proposed an increase to eleven seventy. And this does not include any potential lawyers' fees. Those can definitely be Which are serious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I also, I think everybody got the statement from Gilberto. Yes. Yes, Santos. thank yeah. you for this. Okay. That was good. Okay. He was not able to be here because he's working. One of the most powerful things about this conversation for me is the fact that it passed in Montpelier by 3,300 votes, 900 yeah. against. That's like four to one. Yeah. And that's a pretty strong vote. Yeah, yeah. it was a strong vote. Yeah. yeah, it was very interesting to go around and talk to people about it in the petition process and get so much support. Because I think one of the things that, in terms of the time I've spent on this committee, you know, we do a lot of charter changes, as you know, as you can imagine. And I always feel like whether I totally agree with what local folks are trying to do or not, if local citizens pass a charter change, I start from this premise of who am I to tell them they can't do something that they democratically elected mm -hmm. to do. Right. Yep. It, I found it very interesting that um, the only time in the governor's budget address there was a standing ovation was when he talked about um, welcoming 
more immigrants into the state of Vermont. And um, so if we're going to welcome more immigrants into the state of Vermont, this might be a good way of showing a welcome. Instead of just saying welcome, mm -hmm. um, and also we're dealing in the OPR bill, we're dealing with um, credentialing and uh, license transfers and things like that for people who are coming. So we, if we're going to welcome more immigrants, we need to actually I'll put our money where our mouth is, <laughs> or sort of whatever that means. <laughs> but anyway. Right, to show a value of a welcoming and proximity. Right. Instead of just having a welcome banner. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, I've talked to a number of people. I don't think we're ready to vote on this today. I was hoping we were, but I think there. So I'm going to try and put it on a uh, possibly for. And I I do apologize to the people of Montpelier because I know you wanted this to to um, go through so that you could um, set it up for town meeting this year. I just don't see that that's going to happen because it has to get through here and then the governor has to sign it and he has so if we voted on it at, there's a possibility that we could vote on it on Thursday because it seems we have some local government no that's not this Thursday that's the 13th but we do have um, Wednesday Wednesday, Wednesday. So that's tomorrow mm -hmm. that's tomorrow we were supposed to um, hear the Vermont National Guard sexual assault report with the House members. It turns out that the House members are going to have a really, really long session because they have a lot of contentious things to vote on tomorrow, plus a governor's override. So we have some time before 2.30, so I suggest that maybe we be prepared to vote on it then. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, no, not tomorrow. I thank you. Okay. Thursday. We'll see if we can move something and vote it on around Thursday. So, thank you, Anthony. My pleasure. <laughs> okay. Keeping us on track. It's always thank you, Roberto. So much. Thank you. Yes. It's always a good thing in this committee to have good vice chairs. Both Anthony and Brian have acted as great vice chairs, keeping me on track. Okay, thank you. Goodbye.